the sensational Alex Harvey band on Rock Sport on a Sunday night is Tom Russell in the chair and uh, we're joined now by a, a, a special guest who was supposed to come in and see us last week but he got lost. I did indeed. <laughs> but he's made it tonight and he's in for a, a, a wee chat with us. David Cowan. David, welcome. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Soul album, Out of the Dark. Yep. Uh, tell us a little bit about it. Um, well, it's an album that I've been working on for a couple of years, um, on and off. And um, a few people that I know close to me were saying, you should do something on your own. And at that point, I wasn't sure what kind of direction to go in. And then a friend of mine, Mike Drew, said, well, you're really into John Carpenter and your, your movie soundtracks. Why don't you do something like that? So I thought, hmm, quite interesting. So um, I started listening to a lot of John Carpenter's soundtracks, like Halloween, The Fog, The Thing. Um, and I really enjoyed this sort of sound that it had, a lot of the sequencers, modulators, arpeggiators, and I always was really um, interested in that. So I started developing ideas, and I come up with the first track that's on the album, um, Horizon, it's called. That was the first song that I wrote, and from there I just kind of started working around from there, and all the ideas started to come very quickly, um, and recorded it all myself. Right. It's mainly instrumental? It's mainly instrumental. There's two introduction parts on vocals. I've got Max Maxwell, who was a singer with the Sensational Alex Harvey Band a few years ago. Um, he does introduction, and obviously Mike Drew, who inspired me to do the album, does the monologue towards the end. It's a fairly unusual thing that in this day and age, uh, an instrumental rock album. Uh, uh, how confident are you that there's a market there for it? Um, well, originally it was just going to be a, a, an actual album for me to do on my own. It was nothing, I wasn't planning to release it. I was going to do it purely for my own reel. And people who had heard sort of clips and demos that I'd sent, they were saying it was really good. And more and more people were saying, right, when it's finished, I want to get a copy of it, I want to I want to hear the whole thing. So I was like, right, okay, well, there seems to be a, a sort of demand for it. Not a major demand, but there was a demand for people to hear it. So I just kind of kept pl plugging along with it. I'm looking at the, the sleeve and uh, at the first glance of the sleeve, it looks as though it's just got your name and the, and the title at the bottom. But mm -hmm. then when you look a bit closer, there's a really good photograph. And uh, you were telling me just before we, we, we came on here that it's uh, your good self. Yeah, it is. It's a sort of subtle photograph. I'm, I'm not one for having my face plastered all over covers and stuff, but um, it was a, a photograph that Mike had taken when I was on the road with Zal, and um, we were just outside a venue, and he took a few close-ups of my face, and when I saw some of them back, um, I decided to take the best one I felt and just blended it in with the actual artwork. So it's got that sort of creepiness to it, so you don't actually see it at first glance, but that was, that was the whole point of it. Where did you record the album? I recorded the album at home, uh, on my, my laptop. Uh, really? Logic Pro, Cord Kronos and all the sounds that were on there recorded it all at home. Didn't that's, cost me a penny. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. Amazing. We'll play a track from it. Pick, pick one. Um, one of my favourite tracks on it is actually the track Replicant. Um, it's, quite, it's quite foot tapping, so yeah, we'll go with that one. Okay, Replicant. From the album Out of the Dark, this is David Cowan on Rock Sport. From the album Out of the Dark, that's uh, David Cowan uh, with uh, a track titled Replicant. Uh, David's our guest on Rock Sport this Sunday evening. Uh, David, uh, Perhaps people won't be too well aware of your uh, mm -hmm. uh, of your career so far. I, I, I've worked with you a number of times over the years. Yep. Um, you you were with the sensational Alex Harvey band, experienced and uh, still are. Yes, I still am. I've been doing that since two thousand and fourteen. Um, that band kind of fell together um, by chance. Um, we started out as a band called the Resonators. We were basically just a blues rock band playing places like the Ferry and things like that. And um, we actually had Amos Moses and Delilah in Merset. And a friend of mine, James Hawk, who runs the Sabrock Convention, had come along to see us and thought that we'd done a really good job of the, the songs. And they thought, would you be interested in doing this live as a full set? So I put it to the guys and kind of asked them what they thought. And they went, yeah, we could, we could probably do this justice. So we'd done Sabrock 6, I think was the first one we'd done. And we'd done a full set. And... Uh, People were, were really happy with how we'd done the songs and then the following year we, we dressed up, we'd done the costumes, we made it a wee bit more of a, a show and it's just progressed ever since. And from there I've 
sort of sprung on to working with Chris Glenn in the outfit for a few years and then latterly um, Sal Clemenson with the Sin Dogs. That must have been, uh, you've been a, an Alex Harvey fan, you must have been blown away to be asked to work with <clears throat> Oh, it was Sal. a dream. It was an absolute dream. Um, first of all, working with Chris, it was it was a great experience um, working with the outfit. But because I was doing the Alex Harvey experience and doing Chris Glenn in the outfit at the same time, it was I felt as if I was in... I was doing the same music with two bands and I felt, right, okay, I need to try and do something different. And it was literally about a year after that, uh, Zal had contacted me, he was living in Cyprus with Rachel and said that he was putting an album together and he wanted me to be part of it. So we began throwing demos back and forward. We managed to get about seven or eight songs together and then we thought, wait a minute, these songs would be great as a band. So right away I thought, the sensational Alex Harvey experience, what about these guys? So he flew over for Cyprus and came for a a jam with us and he, he really liked the, the band so we we formed very very quickly and we done our first tour in 2017 and it was it was great so it was a dream actually working with Alan he's, he's a really nice guy as well but um, he's now as many people know the Sin Dolls is no more and he's now working on a new project so yeah but it was a great experience Got to ask you the question what happened though? Um, well, a lot, of, a lot of politics involved, but I think it really boils down to Zal has a unique vision of what he hears in his head for the songs. So I think he wanted to move in a different direction. We were wanting to go in a different direction, and there was just a clash. And it was just right, OK, well, it's his project, it's his baby. Um, and we just decided to kind of call it a day. Personally, I, I think the band was starting to get somewhere. Um, with a few teething problems, as you know, winter storm and things that the band didn't showcase themselves the way they should have. Um, but last year, when we done Crop Ready, we done Sweden Rock, we, we were starting to really gather momentum and gather steam. And we were in the, just in the middle of recording a new EP, and then the next minute, it was just like, no, that's everything's off. Mm. And um, it all happened the day my son was born. So I was catching up with everything on Messenger. Yeah, we did. Um, so yeah, I was I was up at the the hospital and um, it just all happened so quickly. I was like, really, is this the end of Sin Dogs? I mean, we've only been together two years and just as the band was getting good, it's just like the carpet swept away and I was like, no, okay. Still feel quite raw about it, but you know, it's like, what's for you'll no go by you. And I've got a few a few irons in the fire now. Um, got a few, few projects on the horizon, so it's not going to stop me. Definitely not. You mentioned Winterstorm, and as uh, you know, I was compared at that uh, mm -hmm. particular day, and uh, and uh, it, it was a shame because the the crew that are there mm -hmm. are very efficient. Ten fifteen minute changeovers between each band, and yep. it normally works fine. Um, but for some reason, with well, you guys, there were, I think it, the, there was a faulty cable, and you were on stage just about ready to start playing, yep. and this fourth faulty cable and it took about 10 minutes to uh, to, to find where the fault was and yep. fix it and I thought you guys you should go off the stage yep. and just let the PA guy play a bit of music until it's sorted mm -hmm. and then come back on and I think it was the, the impression I got was Zal was getting angrier and angrier getting frustrated was, yeah. Yeah. on that stage because things weren't perfect yeah uh, and it was just a, a, a shame what happened. I think because it was a, a big Scottish festival, I think Zal really wanted to create an impression. I think he wanted to go on the stage and um, just blow people away and go, this is this is my band, this is Sin Dogs, this is what we're all about. And things just didn't go the way we planned. Um, I mean, I'm only 33, but I would have handled it differently the way Zal did. Um, at the end of the gig, Zal kind of just got in his car and drove away. So me and the drummer at the time, Louis, um, we had to go down and address the fans and people were saying, where's Al, where's Al? And we're like, well, he's, he's, he's away. away he's away home, you know? Um, and there was a wee bit of a sort of sabbatical at that point where we were like, right, is the band going to stay together? Is it not going to stay together? And we eventually we kind of pulled them together and we said, look, this band's good. Let's not ruin it. Let's not waste an, an opportunity. So um, at that point, the drummer had left and we brought in uh, Carlos Marin, who's a, who was a phenomenal drummer. Um, and the band just started to gather steam again. And as I say, we'd done Sweden Rock, we'd done Crop Ready, we'd done quite a few festivals down south and we were getting really well received. And then we thought, right, it's time to do an EP. And we were halfway through it and then it was just like, nope, not happening. And that was that was it, just, it just got canned like that. So. 
You play keyboards and uh, piano, organ, the whole lot. Mm -hmm. And uh, most young young guys, when they, they they want to get into rock and roll, want into, uh, into bands. It's, it's lead guitar, it's bass, it's drums, whatever. Yeah. Uh, it's unusual is too strong a word, but it, it's relatively unusual for a, a young rock fan to decide I'm going to be a keyboard player. Mm -hmm. You know. Probably out of every hundred, there's probably seventy want to be a guitarist, twenty want to be a bass player, Absolutely. nine want to be drummers, and one wants to be a keyboard player. Uh, do you find though it's an advantage for getting work the fact that uh, uh, there's not as many keyboard players out there as there are guitarists? Yeah, it is. I've, I'm actually starting to notice that now. Um, I don't actually know if it's because the sound dolls are no longer together. There's there's been offers that have been have been offered to play with various bands. Um, but yeah, being a keyboard player does have its advantages. You you, you get offers hit left, right, and centre for for playing in a church or playing playing a wedding, playing a funeral. Um, so yeah, I, I do believe it's got its advantages. Maybe not the coolest instrument to be playing in a band, but um, I look up at guys like Jordan Rudis from Dream Theater, um, John Lord, um, I'm a big fan of Toto as well, David Page. Um, Steve Piccaro, I like people like that. So I've got a lot of influences in different styles of rock, um, like Stevie Wonder as well, Jules Holland. So my influences are ranging all over the spectrum. So, yeah. Can you remember the first track that you ever heard that made you say, I'm going to play, take up keyboard? Um, it was actually my parents had bought me a sort of toy keyboard. It was actually a, a stocking filler for my fourth Christmas and it had all the London bridges falling down and all that sort of thing and once the demo had stopped I started playing it with my finger and my parents were like he's actually playing that so it kind of progressed from there I went to music lessons to try and read music I couldn't quite grasp the whole left hand right hand reading it together I got to about grade five but everything my teacher was showing me on paper, I was naturally going into my ear anyway, so I felt I was kind of cheating myself. So I got to grade five and I thought, right, I'm I'm doing well playing by ear. It's never stopped me before. I don't know if I really need this sort of armory just now. Maybe come back to it in a few years. But um, yeah, it's, I've I've been playing by ear since I was four, and it's never stopped me. So, but the first song um, to answer your question, Tom, the first song I think I ever played um, was Van Halen, Jump. <laughs> I remember my dad showing me it years ago. Um, 1984, so that's 16, 35, 36 years ago. Well, I was born in 86, so you're probably talking maybe early 90s. I started kind of uh, trying to work out the chords. Um, so, yeah, that was probably the first kind of rock song I played. Brilliant. David, pleasure talking to you tonight on, on Rock Sport. Um, I will play another track from uh, from your solo album, Out of the Dark is the album, mm -hmm. and again, I'd like you to select a, a track and tell us why. Um, the next track I would pick is actually Horizon, because that was the first song that I wrote, and um, it's got that sort of John Car Carpenter sort of feel, um, and it's got a great melody, um, really kind of interesting synth solo towards the end, so yeah, Horizon. We'll play out with it. Dave, thanks for coming in. Uh, pleasure talking to you. Just quickly, how do people get hold of the album? Um, you can order it via my Facebook page. Uh, if you just contact me through Facebook um, or um, send me an email, which is at davidjazz86 at gmail.com um, or effectively check my website out, which is davidcowanofficial.co.uk. Thanks, Dave. Thank you, Tom. Cheers, man. David Cowan with Horizon. Once again, thanks to David for coming in, having a, a little chat with us here on Rock Sport on this Sunday night, and uh, I bring in a copy of his debut solo album uh, with David Cowan on Rock Sport.